way. Honey, this is a hospital, and we're going to get you a, a painkiller for that banged-up head of yours. What's wrong with my head? Why is it killing me like this? Nothing, nothing, honey. It just got in the way of a flying chair, that's all. Chair? <laughs> Tanks! <laughs> yeah! <laughs> Come on. Look at here. Boy, you missed one hell of a fight. <laughs> you almost killed a guy. And this here is a prize. <laughs> I know we was in a fight. Oh. This bronze head is really messed up. You're right. Lou, give me a beer. Yeah. You should have been there. I broke a nose. I laid one dude out cold. <laughs> Left one on his knees screaming for Jesus. <laughs> Can I get you anything, honey? Hey, sit over here. Ah, uh, skip it. Woman like that won't come when a man calls. You have a rough night, lady? What's your name? I don't remember my name. Oh. Did you hear that? Man, sluts is all alike. Just love teasing a man. You see that? She heard that, but she wouldn't turn around. Gotta remember one thing, sluts is cagey. She ain't never gonna lose that slut look, no matter how hard she tries. Because there's always gonna be a little too much rouge on the cheeks, and a little too much mascara in the eyes. There's always gonna be a little too much of everything. And why do you think she wears so much lipstick? It's because she knows that by the end of the night, she's gonna be kissing so many men, and she's gonna need that much, so it'll last. Man, I'm gonna tell you something. You put a diamond on a slut and it'll turn to rhinestone. She's got cash registers in her eyes that keep lighting up. Sale, sale! Every man that she ever slept with has left his mark on her face. Now you look at that slash on her face, how do you think that got there? Well, her new lover come home, found her in bed with another man, and took his fine leather belt to her face, but it didn't work, because you can't never beat the slut out of a slut. It's like a disease, man. There ain't no cure for it, except men, and lots of them. The next one you give the girl a break. It ain't her fault the way she is. <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> man, if you believe that, you believe anything. Uh, I'm going to tell you something. There's only two ways for a woman in this life. Either an honest wife or a low-lying slut. That bitch, I could make her right here and now, and she'd let me. You know why? Because she can't say no. Ain't that the truth, sweetheart? That'll get you hot, won't it? I mean, won't that make you feel all hot inside? That's enough, Tex. Now you knock it off. Don't pay no attention to him, ma'am. He's just drunk. Hey, welcome to Ward 13 with John Hopwood. That's an ancient one, Brendan. Uh, what happened to just playing old Ward 13? I must have created that one when it first was on here. But uh, that being as it may, that was Sid Haig and Harry Dean Stanton in Heidi Hamer, the Honorable Heidi Hamer's fav one of her favorite TV shows, Mary Hartman, Mary Hartman. And we have uh, a returning guest award 13, Edward X. Young, the actor, makeup artist, and special effect artist in many a grade Z movie and some, uh, you know, uh, bit parts and uh, movies with The Rock and others uh, to talk about uh, Sid Haig, who he knew. Ed, how are you? I'm doing great here in New Jersey. 
I do, I do miss the Granite State. Yes, I'm very proud to say that Sid Haig was a friend of mine. I knew him well. We communicated often. And I'm sorry that we lost him on September 21st at the age of 80. But I've, I've, got, I've got great anecdotes to tell. I mean, we were friends for well over 15 years. Oh, okay. You also knew uh, quickly Harry Dean Stanton, then you or you had met him. Uh, didn't you meet him after uh, Paris, Texas came out? And what was the famous? Yes, what did yes, you that, tell him? Harry Dean Stanton was rather rude to me. He didn't like me. Sid Haig liked me a lot. Yes, I, I met Harry Dean Stanton at the New York Film Festival in 1984, where the the uh, the opening night film was uh, the closing night film. Was Paris, Texas. Wim Wenders. Sasha Kinsky was also in that. And uh, I've, I've long been a fan of Harry Dean Stanton's, and I saw him in the lobby of Lincoln Center. And I was, uh, I, this is 84, I was, I was young, I was 25 years old. But I approached Harry Dean Stanton and told him how thrilled I was to meet him, because he was always my favorite character actor. And he said, character actor, I'm the star of this damn movie. <laughs> Don't you ever call me a character actor again? Well, kind of yeah. me. You, <laughs> you know, character so, actors are. I, I inadvertently yeah. insulted Harry Dean Stanton for not recognizing him as the star of the one and only movie he had top billing in. Okay, Ed, you've got to. Uh -huh. uh, you've got to have breathing space. You know, remember what it's like to be an actor. You've acted in many films. Uh, Character actors, you know, are one of the great uh, joys of being a cineast or a film lover, and uh, he was one of the best. But Sid Haig never reached like the heights of Harry Dean, but he was uh, had a monumental career in what's called exploitation films, didn't he? Oh yes. Well, I, I would argue with you that Sid Haig, uh, at the end of his life, did achieve a superstardom status. Uh, in, uh, for like 40 years, 40 years he struggled and uh, he what? even lamented. He told me how, you know, uh, that there was a time, there was a time in the, I think it was either late 60s or early 70s, he saved the TV Guide because he said in that issue of TV Guide, every day, of every night of the week, he was in one of those shows featured as a supporting actor. Yeah, and he, he yeah. said I still, I still didn't know how I was going to pay the rent that month or buy groceries. <laughs> yeah, some of his role, one of the roles I remember in the early 70s was Diamonds Are Forever, where he's part of the, what was it, the slumber gang that picks Sean Connery up at uh, the Las Vegas airport. And his one line was, because Sean is bringing diamonds in and a dead body that he's pretending is his brother. And, he, and Sid Haig says, uh, I had a brother. <laughs> and Sean Connery, and only the way he could say it, said, small world. And uh, Sid was uh, quite a striking actor in the sense of, he was six foot four, wasn't he? He was six foot four and beefy. He was big and yeah. lumbering with a shaved head and, and like uh, a, a mean ethnic Armenian face. Right, he He's is really the nicest guy in the world, though. But, I mean, yet he was, he was a well-trained actor. And also was trained in ballet. I mean, he was actually could be rather graceful. He was a an awkward, bumbling kid, and his parents thought that ballet lessons might give him some grace in his demeanor. And he said it had helped him as an actor. But if you can imagine Sid Haig doing ballet, it's hard to it's hard to picture that, but it's true. Okay, Ed, uh, because I'm thinking, you know, Sean Connery was six two, which is pretty, you know, and. Uh Sid Haig can hold his own physically with him. But, you know, it's funny that Connery studied yoga, and they said that gave him his ability. One of the reasons he was cast as Bond, because they said he moved like a panther. But I'm going to, uh, Brendan, can we show uh, the first, I, I guess it's video B. It is the role that uh, helped make Sid into a cult superstar. Uh, it's his Captain Spaulding in uh, The Devil's Rejects. Where is it? Calm down, we'll be on in a minute. Ah! <gasps> there it is! Over there! Oh, 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 oh. Yeah. You look so well, sexy. Howdy, hey, Joe. I'll Captain Spaulding again. Yes, I'm here to tell you about a brand new attraction. Mary. Oh, <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> Just here, little uh -huh. honey. Half real human, half monkey. I 
brought all the way from the wilds of Borneo. <laughs> so y'all come in, make sure you bring little Johnny and Susie with you. She'll scare the holy guacamole out of them. <laughs> and remember, while you're down here, pick up your Captain Spaulding yeah. for President. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. All shapes. Now, what the <laughs> is this? I paid good money for this goddamn commercial. Sheriff, Sheriff, news update. What is the situation here now? Situation? Yes, what uh, is the situation? Now what? God damn it! What is... Yeah, what? Daddy, you gotta get out of there. What? The pigs hit us this morning real bad. You gotta uh, get out of there. Oh, oh, shut the They're gonna be coming for you, too. All right, all right, just calm down, baby. Calm down now. Uh, I'll meet you at the Kiki Palms Motel, just like we always planned. Yeah, okay. And I'll be there as soon as I possibly can, all right? All right, just go now. And uh, in honor of the Honorable Heidi Hamer's uh, husband, Gary, we also have the, the clip that we'll have in a little while of the <laughs> Don't be afraid. Are you afraid of clowns? Which is also heavily uh, censored. <laughs> but tell us about... We won't. We won't. Okay. Was the, yes. was the Devil's won't. Rejects the big hit or was the... That was a sequel to what was it? Uh, the th what was it? The Thousand the Corpses? House, the, house, uh, the, the House of a Thousand Corpses. Uh, Allow me to quote Sid Haig when we were discussing his career. He said there were three men, direct film directors, who he would walk over fire for if they asked him. Tarantino? The first is Jack. He said the first is Jack Hill, because Jack Hill gave him his first really memorable role in, in The Spider Baby in the right. early 60s. And he oh. had to act with his childhood hero with Lon Chaney Jr. Awesome movie. Jack Hill put him on the map. Awesome but he said movie. In his career, he was always a working actor. He was always starving, never had enough money to pay the bills, but the people, he hadn't worked for about four years. There were, people thought he was dead, and it was it was Quentin Tarantino yep. who discovered Sid Haig live, and he, he loved to dig people out who were, like, forgotten, and he offered him originally the role of Marcellus no, in oh. Pulp Fiction, which in Ring, Ring Rames and won Ving Rames awards, awards, but Sid Haig's agent turned down the role of Marcellus. He didn't think it was big enough. And he said he, he, got, he fired his agent after that. He said he was <laughs> furious. But he explained to Tarantino, I didn't reject you, but Tarantino followed up by giving him the role of the judge in Foxy Brown. Right. And when, when, when Rob Zombie was watching Foxy Brown, he was like, isn't that the guy who starred in Spider Baby? Not Foxy. Back in 1960. Well, he was in and Foxy Brown. Brown, you're talking about Tarantino's movies, Jackie Brown. He was in, uh, Jack, Jack, was it Cleopatra Jackie, Jones? Jackie Brown, Cleopatra Jones. Jackie Brown. Yeah. And he was a judge. Yeah. And, and but the thing is, Tarantino saw Jackie Brown and said, I didn't know this guy Sid Haig was still alive. I love Spider Baby. And he contacted him and offered him the lead role in the House of a Thousand Corpses as Captain Spaulding. And Sid said, after asking for over 40 years with all my training, Finally, at the age of 63, Rob uh, Zombie made me a star because suddenly I was the lead of this hit movie, another sequel, The Devil's Rejects, which came out 30 years later. And uh, as he said, he said, I, uh, you know, I never won an Oscar. He goes, but I could walk into any Halloween store and they got Captain Spaulding masks. He goes, you could find Captain Spaulding action figures, T-shirts. He said, people got Captain Spaulding tattooed on their arms. Or their backs. He said, I, I figure I've, I've gone further than winning an Academy Award. He goes, it's a greater honor. <laughs> uh, are you in a car? Yes, I am in a car. Well, you're, we're having some problems and there's a lot of static. I mean, step, I'm not driving, though. I'm going to step outside. Oh, okay. I thought well, you were driving and going, uh, you haven't gone out yet. But, you know, uh, 
one of the reasons Tarantino cast him in Jackie Brown was because he had been in a... Which was the movie he was in with Pam Greer? Uh, was it Cleopatra was, was Jackie Jones? Brown. No, but he was in a movie with her before. Was it Coffee? Uh, I think so. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Oh, back in the black, black exploitation days. By the way, yeah, Jack Hill. Outside. Outside of Jack Hill uh, directed that. Yeah. Yes, yeah. J Jack Hill worked with Sid Haig a lot, and they were good, and they were good friends. Jack Hill is still alive; he's uh, eighty-six years old. But right. He said, he said Jack Hill put me on back. Always gave me work when he could. Tar uh, Tar Tarantino resurrected my career when people thought I was dead, and that Rob Zombie made me a superstar. Well, you have to remember Tarantino was a clerk at a video store and actually watched Ooh. watched all the movies. He was a cinema head. And he loved trashy movies and exploitation movies. We have a lot of fans here at uh, Manchester Public TV uh, service that are fans of the worst movies ever made. What was your? Let's briefly ask you. What's the wor your favorite worst movie ever made? My favorite worst movie ever made. I'm. I'm a. Uh, I, I gotta admit, I love. I totally love the brain that would not die, and we just lost Vivian Leith, who was the head in the pan, uh, uh, like two weeks ago. Yeah. But uh, I, 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 I adore that movie. It was shot in 1959 and considered too raw to release until 1962. But truly, I, I think it's a movie that defines the essence of what grindhouse cinema is all about. Well, grindhouse is one thing because that actually uh, was never considered the bad movie. It's just, uh, you know, a genre, uh, uh, genre I think movie. you're right. Bad, bad movies, uh, you know, it's so easy to say Plan 9 from Outer Space, which I think is actually gets a bum rap. It's a very entertaining movie. Maybe The Creeping Terror is the best bad movie ever made. <laughs> That's a stinker. My favorite uh, Ed Wood movie is The, Night of the, is the Bride of the Atom, uh, Bride of the Monster, where, uh, with, oh, well, uh, you know... From the, 53, the, feast of, 50, the Feast of Flats oh, that's is awful. the worst of all the tortured movies. <laughs> that's awful. <laughs> that one's just a stinker. Oh, the my God. Flats, with, 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 they lost the soundtrack and so had to do the whole movie with the, the producer just narrating the movie. It was essentially a, released as a solid movie with narration because they misplaced the soundtrack, all the dialogue. Well, those things happen, you know. They actually do when you're like an independent filmmaker. And, uh... <laughs> Sorry, there are disasters that just befall you, you know. Um, but, the, but the best part of the Bianca Flats is that the, the narrator, the producer, is narrating action before we see it. It was like, and yeah. then the beast killed the detective. And then you see him kill the detective. I mean, he was like foreshadowing everything, telling the action before it took place. It's, it's pretty. It's pretty outrageous if you watch it. I mean, he, he just spoils. The producer himself spoils every scene. Narrating the movie. You know, uh, Russ Meyer when he directed one of his uh, grindhouse. What would you call Russ Meyer? You're not exactly grindhouse. Softcore exploitation. He's a person that probably made. He made millions off of those movies. But in uh, Cherry, Harry, and Raquel, uh, 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 Roger Ebert who wrote the screenplay for two of his movies, uh, Beyond the Valley of the Dolls and Beyond the Valley of the Ultra Vixens. Uh, the Pulitzer Prize winning Roger Ebert wrote two soft, poor, soft core porn movies, folks. But uh, allegedly, uh, Ebert always said that uh, the lab destroyed some of the, the movie, and so he had to just reshoot without any actors or anything. You know, one of his... Uh, you know, one of the one of the Russ Meyer women, you know, which uh, defy description, and he just had to edit it. But Meyer was a genius in editing. If, if you remember his movies, they he was given an award by MTV because it was so uh, kinetic. You know, they say he hated anybody blinking in his movies, so it was just this incredibly fast, incredibly well, fast I'm editing. Meyer was also a great photographer. Yeah. I mean, the best, the best, in my opinion, the best of the classic Playboy centerfolds were shot by Russ Meyer. I knew Yvette Vickers, who oh, died really? tragically about 10 years ago, but she was the uh, Playmate of the Month for July of 59, and Russ Meyer did her famous centerfold, and she talked about how he 
what a what a really nice guy he was. Now he put her at ease, and and they had a lot of fun on the shoot. But uh, but he was a, he was a, a very talented man. Well, uh, like uh, Stanley Kubrick was a great, was a very noted photographer since he, as a kid, and afterwards, and uh, but the William Goldman who died, William Goldman died a couple of years ago, I think. The Oscar, two Oscars, you know, Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid, his most famous screenplay, which was a very revolutionary screenplay. Uh, he said the only he, he he said the. Uh, the only auteur he ever uh, knows about, because he's criticizing the auteur theory, where the director is the author of a film, was Russ Meyer. Because Meyer just didn't direct the film. He wrote it, he, photo he photographed it, and he edited it. And, uh, oh, you know, uh, uh, ha if I remember, Harry Charing Raquel is famous for introducing Charles Napier. The uh, character actor who was in a lot. Of, oh, who, yeah. oh, who was who was the director? Oh. He was in the movies. Uh, Jonathan Demme loved him. You know, oh, he was in that great movie Citizens Band, which you ne you can never find anymore. Where he had the two wives. <laughs> oh yeah. You talk about yeah. He yes. was a unique character actor. He was a hell of a character actor. I guess most people would just remember his. The guard in uh, Science of the Lips. Okay, go ahead. I have, a story, but I have a story that Sid Haig, which needs to get out there because people there you don't go. know what kind of a, a person he was. He, he put forward this image that he was the baddest of the badasses. Yeah. But Sid and I became friends when I wrote a review for the Keen Sentinel's online paper when I was reviewing the 2006 Oscars, which they were advertising as the year of the independence. Right. And they gave the Oscar to Seymour Hoffman for the independent movie Capote. And I said, if these, if these people were, t were really being honest, that, that if it really is the year of the independent, I, I said that, you know, the Devil's Rejects should be the, get the award for best picture, and, and Sid Haig and Bill Mosley should share an Oscar for best actor. And, and it was that article that I wrote, which Bill Mosley saw online, contacted me, we became sort of pen pals, I eventually met him at the convention, but he said that he forwarded it to Sid, when I met Sid at a convention about a year later, when I mentioned my name, he knew exactly who I was. We formed a friendship. We had lunch. We talked. Yep. And he said, nobody ever nominated, nobody ever suggested I should win an Oscar before. Because I've gotten a few good reviews. He goes, I'm going to remember this. He goes, monsters like us have got long memories. And we became friends. But Sid Haig, I was a newspaper man, as you know, and, yes. and also worked other business jobs. But... After my divorce, when I decided to go into acting, and Sid was very encouraging, and he said it'll be tough. He, he told me, he said, I struggled for 40 years not knowing how to pay the rent. He goes, you're taking some wild risks, but this is the kind of man Sid Haig was. So I, I was doing a lot of big parts or small supporting roles. When I was offered my first lead role in an independent grindhouse movie, the movie was called The Devil's Rejects. The character, this was definitely a... a Rip off of the Devil's Rejects, and I was being offered the Captain Spaulding role. And uh, I wrote Sid Haig through email. I told him what the news was. I said, I'm finally got my first lead role, and he you let me back. Great. And I said, It's a rip off of Captain Spaulding. And one of these well, Captain Spaulding, yeah, let's explain, was a character in Animal Crackers played famously by Groucho Marx. And we're going to end the show with him singing, uh, Hello, I Must Be Going. Which, too bad that S S Sid Haig didn't say it. Okay, go ahead. But, but anyway, Sid, Sid Haig said, send me the script. And I said, I, I thought, really, he wants to see the script. So I emailed him the full script. And I expected some words of advice. About a week later, I get an email back, which when I printed it out, it was eight pages long. And he analyzed the script. Kind of like me. me <laughs> suggestions and tips for each scene on how to play it properly. Like, this is a really good scene. Now, you don't want to blow it by going over the top, dot, 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 you know, ellipsis. I suggest you play it this way. If you want to be an effective maniac, you got to keep in mind that, you know, you got to believe you're the only sane person in the room. I, 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 was, I kept this uh, document with me on the set of The Green Monster and referred to it as, as these young directors were, like, not really directing me. I, I let Sid Haig direct him. Like, what did he say about scene eight? And I used it, and even I contacted him back, I said, I've got a master of southern accent for this, I'm not too good at that. And he said, ah, it's easy. He goes, just drag out your vowels, and at the end of words, let your...
consonant slip. You'll sound southern. <laughs> oh man! As and, uh, ca- yeah, yeah, when I a, a few years later, the movie got released. I won a Best Actor award at a independent horror film festival for it. And when I was at a discussion, a public discussion with the Sid Haig at a convention, I stood up and I acknowledged him, thankfully, for like doing this. And and he he, he joked. He sat on the stage. He goes, ah, you know, really, it worked for you. I sent you all rotten advice. I wanted you to fuck it up. <laughs> Ed, you just asked. Uh, you know, did you get that, really Brendan? I wanted to Ed, ask you. Ed, you just a- Ed, shut up. You just f bombed. Yeah. Um, did you get that, Brendan? Yes. Jeez, sorry, Ed. All right, Ed. I'm gonna. We're gonna run another clip. You gotta calm yourself down, and I'm gonna call you back because it's a lousy connection. But uh, yeah, call me back. I'm gonna, I'll, pick up, I'll pick up the phone. Call me back. I'm gonna call you on right. our phone, but uh, we'll probably have to edit this okay. part out. And uh, you need to control yourself. All right. Well, All right, let's do right the. Uh, let's do the other right. uh, devil's rejects, and I'm gonna call you back. Hang up now. Secret clown business that supersedes any plans that you might have for this here vehicle. <laughs> <laughs> What's that about clown business? <laughs> uh, stutter. Jamie, get in the car. Lock the door. Where the hell are you going? Damn it. Don't you never turn your back on <laughs> clown when he's talking to you. Hands off of me! <laughs> Matter, kid, don't you like clowns? Why? Hey, don't hey. we make you laugh? Aren't we <laughs> funny? You best come up with an answer, because I'm going to come back here and check on you and your mama. If you ain't got a reason why you hate clowns, I'm going to kill your whole <laughs> family. All right, now get your ass out the car. Come on. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Woo. Okay, all right, Ed, now you calm down and follow my lead. And uh, it's funny, I was talking to uh, Brendan, uh, my director, that when you cut the swears out and there's nothing there, you don't hear anything. But once you put the sensors beep in, you hear the, you know, your brain just spills it right in. It's really weird. But uh, I'd already warned him that you get rambunctious and f bomb. You almost got banned I'm, I'm, I'm by my sorry, last but, director. But, I'm sorry about that f bomb. But let me just okay. The story. okay. I mean, no. Sid did a wonderful thing. I mean, he, he analyzed the script and helped me succeed. And when I got to when I saw him in private, we were having dinner. I said, you, know, "You didn't have to do that. You actually read the script and analyzed it." He said, "Hey, look." He said. You're middle aged. You try to make it as an actor. And he goes, "I knew how hard I struggled." And he said, "There was a fine." older actor who helped me when I was a young struggling actor and I always said I came back if I forgot the opportunity. The actor was Buddy Ebsen who helped oh, wow. Sid Haig when he was a young struggling actor. He said Buddy Ebsen was like an uncle to him. He gave him great advice early in his career and he said I promised that I'd, I'd pay it back someday. That someday if I, I'd help other younger actors. If they needed advice I would go out of my way to do it for them. Okay, and now quiet, Don, and uh, uh, rein yourself in. I'm going to read you something from a notebook I have. It's a, right. uh, it's a script. It, this plays off what you're saying about uh, you're getting an eight-page uh, uh, email from, uh, yeah. from Sid Haig that uh, analyzes stuff. So remember, I'd send you ten-page uh, uh, emails when you talk. Talk beep about the green monster and stuff like that. But by the way, before you f bombed, I was thinking, geez, you know, when he said, you know, 
you can to do a southern accent, you elongate your vowels. And one of the f bombs Sid Haig does when you know the uh, scene, uh, you uh, you don't like clowns. Jeez, he dragged the thing out so much. You know, I had to like double uh, double the uh, sensor bleep. Okay, here here's my notebook. It says M. You never make love to me. G. I feed you with blood, blood and meat and souls. Isn't that enough? I've kept my part of the bargain. M, that bargain was with my daddy, not me. G, your pappy never told me nothing about love. Now, I'm sure the G must be Gerald. Cause <laughs> I probably was doing some script doc. And you probably, you know, from a 10-page thing, you probably, you told me uh, either that or, or mold. You use one line, but, you know. Hey, people get paid hundreds of thousands of dollars and, and one line appears in the movie. <laughs> In, 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 in my movie Mold, where I play the Colonel, it's a science fiction monster movie. Right. I get to use one of the, I, I got one of your lines in the movie. It's a big laugh line. <laughs> but, I'm, I'm, smoking, I'm smoking a cigar, and and the scientist warns me that I'm a I'm a hardened I'm a hardened battle veteran, a Colonel from Vietnam, and the mad scientist warns me that those cigars that will kill me that are good for my health. And I said, are you kidding me? And I go on about my battle experiences. And he goes, I, I go, I ain't afraid of this little cigar. It's a Cuban. <laughs> that was your line. And it gets a big laugh every time it's screamed. But, you know, uh, everybody's a community. Everybody tries to help uh, each other out with tips and everything. Uh, I have to introduce you to Veronette. Uh, she is... Uh, from Manchester, she's moving to New Jersey or New York. Uh, she's starting a career in her uh, mid thirties as an actress in movies. She just got a, a role in a movie that's going to be shooting. And I gotta uh, admit, I'd be, I'd be out in Hollywood now if it wasn't for the fact that I got smashed up in a car accident, leaving me semi disabled five years ago. Okay, but yeah, kind of rain in the ego. <laughs> yeah, but. I'd be, I don't say I'd be successful there. I said I was planning on going there. I thought I'd be starving. Nobody but, uh, can afford to live in yeah, California. I'll be, I'll, be back, I'll be back in town on the 8th, but you're not going to be there, are you? December the 8th, I'll be back in town. Why wouldn't I be here in the 8th? Yeah. Hey, I found, a little. I found this one. It's obviously written for you because it says your name on it. Shocker, an original yeah. screenplay by John C. Hopwood. Once again, in a notebook. I found that just, it's funny, today. And, uh, well, hold, on to, hold on to those notebooks. I got more power in this business now. I got more clout. People listen to me. I wrote, I wrote half of The Killer Clown Meets the Candy Man, my latest hit, still on the festival circuit. Which I won a you, Best uh, Actor Oscar for that. Which I mastered you? a Texas accent with a Houston, Texas dialogue coach, so I, I have a proper Southern accent in that one. Yes, that's the, uh, you were on my show last year, and that, that almost got you banned for life. You do get, uh, you do a get. nasty serial killer in that, what could I say? Oh, yes. But, uh, well, this one, uh, is about a mad, uh, some type of mad so doctor who, uh, does brain surgery on young women, and I, I well, just as a young woman, because in any grindhouse movie you need some nudity, right? And uh, preferably uh, non-male, in my opinion. But uh, he's doing uh, brain please, surgery. Please, 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 okay, hold on, Ed. Ed, Ed, Ed Sorry, you're yeah. not the. You're, yeah. Oh, I almost, uh, I almost f r i g bomb. You're not the director okay. here. The director's over outside. I Control That's yourself. Uh, geez, you really... How do they handle you on the set? That's another question we can ask. Uh, well, he's, he's, creating a, he's creating a group of people with telepathic powers that he can control. Possibly, uh, this was probably how Donald Trump, uh, you know, well, won the election, but we won't get into that. <laughs> How do you get? How does somebody as rambunctious as you get the? Con, how do they control you on a set? Uh, I, I deliver the goods. My performance is always uh, thrilling. I do. I do get on some directors' nerves, but they acknowledge that that the goods that I deliver are are, are quality, top notch. I always give a great performance. In great in these grade Z movies, do they allow you to improvise? Uh, it depends on the filmmaker. Uh, I mean. Uh, 
It, de- it really depends. So, uh, there's one guy, James Balsamo, he's pure improv. He gives you index cards with the suggestion right. of the way the scene runs, much like they do on Curb Your Enthusiasm. Yeah. He lets the actors work it out, and we'll do it several ways and choose the best version. But some, some directors, or other, my, my director Dave Madison, did Mr. Hush, is very very strict on the script. I mean, he's written the script, and he, he wants it delivered as written. It depends on the personality. But I was going to interject and tell you that, believe it or not, in this business, they're shying away from nudity now. The whole Me Too movement of really? sort of like put a kibosh in the nudity. Gore is okay, but uh, but they're backing away from any nudity. That's the, that's the new style of the grindhouse horror movies. I guess because there's so much nudity on the internet, it's no longer a, a, a hook to bring people in. Uh, like when we were kids, we would try to sneak in the... We'd sneak into R-rated movies, and I used my brother Guy's ID, and you famously, me, you, and Gary, were at the Jerry Lewis Cinema, and you're six foot three, and you couldn't get in, and you turned around and said, uh, John, show them Guy's ID, which didn't get us into anything that day. <laughs> you blew your line that time. <laughs> but, you know, if one person had an ID, and there was no picture IDs, uh, you could get into an R-rated movie, which, you know... But I, I made a movie recently, which was on the festival circuit. I made it, well, actually, most of it I made a few years ago, which was Bigfoot Blood Trap. And when we were, when we were contracted to make this movie, oh my God. in 2018, we were advised to make it really dirty and raunchy. You have lots of naked women, lots of gore. And that's how we were shooting it. And then I had my serious car accident, which knocked me out of commission for well over a year with surgeries and therapy. I mean, I damn near got killed. Okay, no our, no obscenities. Uh, we leave that up to Sid Haig so we can of, censor it. We resumed, we resumed production after a year and a half break, finished the movie. But when we finished it, the Me Too movement had erupted and the Harvey Weinstein scandal had happened. Suddenly the distributor was like, uh, I, I can't use your movie. It's, it's got too much nudity in it. Could you cut it out? We were like, if we cut out the nudity, the movie's going to be a half an hour long. They were like, well, uh, I, I don't know what I could do with this picture. We were like, you told us to have these scenes. And he goes, times have changed. He goes, the bloodshed is okay, but you can't show so much as a nipple anymore. People will protest it. You should have uh, shot coverage. But it was tough. You should have shot coverage. Amazon Prime, you could rent Bigfoot Blood Trap or even buy the DVD. It's available. You know, uh, uh, write down this. Do you have a pen? Write down this phone number. Write down his phone number. Let me, yeah. let me write the phone number quickly. Get a pen. What's the number? 603. Yeah, one second. My pen isn't working. One moment. We'll okay. put it. Take a moment. 250. 250. 6007. What is that? It is uh, Matt Connors Unleashed in the Afternoon, a, public, a radio show on Manchester's very own. Uh, public FM station. He is the only Yeti American, Yeti, Sasquatch, Bigfoot, whatever you want to call it, that actually has a, uh, you know, an FM show on the commercial dial. I gotta check that out. Uh, Believe it or not, in the course of making our movie, we did research and met people who actually had claimed to have seen uh, Bigfoot. And, uh, And of course, you know, up north where you are in Portland, Maine, uh, D- Dr. Lauren Coleman runs the uh, the world's one and only Bigfoot Museum. Well, you ought to call in. Uh, you could call in today. You know, he is a Yeti American, and he is not a fan of Donald Trump, though. But you know, he likes to argue with people about the president. Well, I, d- I don't have to bring up politics. I could talk Yeti. Well, it is a pol- it is a political show. What? I like a good debate. Some of my best friends are liberals. But you can't F- talk into one of them. You can't F- F- talk into one of them. my best liberal friends. But my, my character in Bigfoot Blood Trap, I, I named him in honor of the guy running the Bigfoot Museum. I called myself Dr. Lawrence Corman. Uh, and I played him as like a mad Captain Ahab. You mean Roger Corman. Blood. Yes, I kind of like him. But L- Lauren Coleman is the director of the Portland... Main Bigfoot Museum, uh, with a leading cryptozoologist in search of the Sasquatch. I, I wonder if he would disapprove of our movie since I played him as a madman. <laughs> a character 
strongly based, him, and he kind of looks like me too. So I, I often wonder if he would approve or disapprove, if he would roll with the humor or not. Hey, what's the average budget of these movies, and where do they? They don't get released in theaters uh, uh, generally. Where? What's? What? How much? Do, uh, these are the questions. How much do they cost? How do they get released? Do they get released at like these fan conventions for horror movies? Is that how they they're shown initially well, to get interest the, in marketing them? The, the, well, for the prices, there, yeah. There's there's a number of good movies I've done, which is, which were made for like uh, under ten grand, even oh, wow. even the Green Monster was about six grand. I mean, the the Killer Clown meets the Candyman was about between forty and fifty. There was I mean, the rule. The rule is the rule is you, you got you have to absolutely keep it under fifty thousand. I'd say the twenty to thirty thousand range is the typical cost of a good one. But I've done some ones which have good scripts. They're really grimy and gritty for like under five thousand. I mean, you know, it, it all depends. Let us not forget the most famous indie movie of all, the most famously successful indie movie of Blair all. Blair Witch. Blair Witch Project was for eleven thousand dollars. Oh, I thought it was and thirty-seven. It is raked in like close to a billion. You know, it is the in Guinness Book of World Records lists it as the most profitable movie right. of all time in relation to budget and and return. So it was an eleven thousand dollar movie. Now I'm you know, going to ask. It, okay, we're going to uh, go to a movie you made, Sea of Dust. Now calm down, center yourself, because you got to star with a legend of horror movies. When we met at West High, we're both class of '77. We met in. 73, our freshman year, we both loved Christopher Lee, uh, 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 and we loved, uh oh, we're going to have to wait on the uh, Christopher Lee anecdote. <laughs> hey, uh, Brendan, why don't we show the, uh, the Irishman uh, trailer? It's over. They're all gone. Frank, it's time. It's time you say what happened. <sighs> Frank, I want you to meet my cousin, Russell Buffalino. Better watch. There's a lot of tough guys around here. Did he tell you? You're not afraid of tough guys, are you? I didn't think so. I was one of a thousand working stiffs. Until I wasn't no more. You got a good friend here. You don't know how good a friend you got. Russell, he took a shine to me right away. After a while, he started giving me little things to do. I know you read a lot of things about me. I just want to say I'm sorry. I know I wasn't a good dad. I know that. I know that. I was just trying to, to protect all you. From what? You didn't see what I see, what I've been through. A friend of ours is having a little trouble. A friend at the top. Hiya, Frank. This is Jimmy Hoffa. Glad to meet you. Big business and the government is on the attack! You want to be a part of this fight? A part of this history? Whatever you need me to do, I'm available. Only three people in the world have one of these, and only one of them is Irish. You know how strong I made you? I know things they don't know I know. He said that? You sure he said that? I'm worried nobody threatens Hoffa. I got records, I got tapes, they're done. I had to put you into this thing. Sooner or later, everybody put here as a date when he's gonna go. I know how you feel, Frank. Trust me, I know how you feel. We'll bring you back after you get your car. Yeah. It's over. They're all gone. Frank, it's time. 
This time you say what happened. <laughs> Frank, I want you to meet my cousin, Russell Buffalino. Better watch, there's a lot of tough guys around here. Did he tell you? You're not afraid of tough guys, are you? I didn't think so. I was one of a thousand working stiffs until I wasn't no more. You got a good friend here. You don't know how good a friend you got. Russell, he took a shine to me right away. After a while, he started giving me little things to do. I know you read a lot of things about me. I just want to say I'm sorry. I know I wasn't a good dad. I know that. I know that. I was... Hey, Ed, you saw The Irishman at the New York Film Festival. We just ran the uh, trailer of it. Tell us about the... Tell us about the Irishman. I I think it's uh, as a as film. I think it's Scorsese. I think it's Scorsese's best picture ever. It's a masterpiece. Uh, it is turned up. Al Pacino, Al Pacino, his performance of Jimmy Hoffa beats anybody else's performance of Jimmy Hoffa. And I always liked Nicholson's version. I think Pacino does it better. He does it better than Robert Blake did it. <laughs> you remember Robert Blake did that on, on a TV miniseries. But I mean. Uh, it's an incredible movie, uh, but I'm wondering, I'm hearing stuff, I'm hearing stuff in the press that, that maybe the story isn't true. No, it isn't it, true, but that doesn't matter. I mean, when you think of Goodfellas, that Henry Hill obviously, uh, the FBI obviously uh, gave him the stories of other people to testify, because he was never that high up to be able to you know, break bread with a capo like he did. I mean, he was uh, he was an Irishman himself, you know, half, you know. Al, Al Pacino's performance as Jimmy Hoffa will bring tears to your eyes. It's maybe the best thing he's ever done as an actor. Funny, he don't look right. Irish, though. I, well, well, don't, well, uh, well, don't forget, Hoffa was an Irish. Hoffa was Pennsylvania Dutch. Oh, Hoffa was Irish. No, Hoffa was a Pennsylvania No, look it up. I swear to you, he was he was half uh, he's half Irish and half Swedish, but you know he was a notorious liar. But it doesn't ma it doesn't matter because this is a movie yeah. about because you know he says that he killed uh, uh, Joey Gallo, which is horse manure. Yeah, I know. That's, uh, so so he's, he's he's responsible for some of the most famous uh, for numerous famous mafia hits. And Kennedy, uh, JFK. But, you know, it's just like uh, when you read, who's that writer that did uh, L.A. Confidential? He writes real pot boilers that are, you know. What's his name? Right. Oh, he's so famous. And I have his books. I can't remember his name. But, you know, he wrote one American tabloid where, you know, like the agent is involved in everything, you know. But, see, that's like Henry Hill. Uh, they actually say nobody ever of his level, because he wasn't even a soldier, he wasn't, he was just connected, ever had such mobility with the mob. Yeah, because the FBI <laughs> prepared him in his testimony to take down the, uh, I, I can't remember, was that the Lucchese family or something? But, yeah, yeah. you know, <laughs> Scorsese is a great, the great film directors of all time, and he makes myths. And, and, and it's, it's a great myth. And uh, like I said, stylistically, uh, storytelling, uh, the performance, it, it's, it's, it's really his best movie ever. I mean, uh, it's probably going to steal a lot of the Oscars, although my personal favorite movie of the year is Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. Oh, well, we can, you can come back and talk about that one because we can talk. Bob Evans died, too. I'd like to talk about Robert uh, Evans' Chinatown and that we, era. We were, we were connected on Facebook, and it was really Bob Evans. We did some back and forth talk about, you know, Chinatown, Rosemary's Lady, and the Godfather. I'm saying, we've lost so many great people this year. And relating to the Devil's Rejects, you realize just last week we lost Michael J. Pollard, one of the stars. Oh, of, Little uh, Billy. Yeah, I mean, Pollard died, and he was in the House of a Thousand Corpses along with Sid. His most famous day. role was Bonnie and Clyde, uh, Warren Beatty. You're right, he was... His father was Pennsylvania Dutch, but his mother was Irish. There you go. 
Yeah. Uh, I, like I said, it, you have two Italians playing in the mix, but but they carry it off rather well. Well, De Niro. De Niro, my friends down in New York City call them the Irish, which in uh, New York that's not a uh, compliment. It means just like Nicholson's called the Irishman out in L.A., which means he's a drunk and he's a womanizer and he likes to gamble. <laughs> so De Niro, I was surprised. My friends uh, said, oh, he's the Irish, just like you are. And his mother was half Hank Yankee and half Irish, so... I gotta throw one more Sid Haig story in. It's, it's, it's valuable advice because before the cancer got him, which you know we all die of something. Prostate someday, cancer, he, yep. But, but but Sid was a really big, robust guy, and even though the last time we we were out eating, I, I commented like he was seventy nine at the time, and he was in great shape and a hell of a iron grip handshake. And, and uh, we were having lunch in this hotel restaurant, and uh, I asked him what the secret was, and that he ate very well, he ate health foods, and uh, he commented on the fact that, you know, I shouldn't have ordered potatoes, and he said, a, a, a key, he said, he said, a key to staying healthy is, he goes, this is my rule, he goes, if it's white, it ain't right, he goes, I'm not talking about race, he said, you gotta stay away from white rice, potatoes, he said, white bread, he goes, I don't eat anything that's white, and he goes, that's what's kept me healthy. <laughs> okay, uh... Maybe Okay, now we're gonna go back to when uh, your the phone uh, your phone uh, went awry. Uh, yeah. When I met you, Ed, calm down. I, I you know if I was if if I knew my military unit, oh geez, I'd bust I'd have to lock you up all the time. Lock you up mean doesn't mean putting you in behind bars by the way, it just means uh, disciplining <laughs> you. But uh, when we met at West High, we found out that we both loved Christopher uh, Lee as Dracula and Hammer Horror movies. You made a movie yeah. called Sea of Dust, a very good movie, which you tried to get me into that movie, but I refu refused to be in it. We won't talk why, or we'd be, we'll get banned for two weeks. And uh, who did you get to, uh, you got to act with a legend of uh, British horror movies and British cinema in a way. Uh, who did you... Who, not, only, not only did I get to act with her, but I say who she I is. Tell. I, I convinced. I convinced the producer to hire her, bring her over from England. Ingrid Pitt. Ingrid Pitt. Of Dracula, the, the Vampire Lovers, The House That Drip Blood, and it was it turned out to be her last movie. Yeah. So I had the honor. I had the honor of acting with Ingrid Pitt on her last picture, and the last person she ever kills on screen, and she usually played a heavy. I'm her last victim, the last person she ever kills on the screen. See, and a rather gory, bloody yeah. death. I'm surprised she was never in a Tarantino movie because Tarantino is a fan of Where Eagles Dare, which she was in. He calls it the movie where, where Clint Eastwood kills the entire German army. <laughs> oh, yes. I, I saw a special screening at the film forum of Where Eagles Dare. Really? The British film wrote a rather comical book. The whole book is dedicated to Where Eagles Dare. And he said that, you know, it's, it's, it's Eastwood's greatest body count. It's like he's is he, is he a soldier or is he a serial killer? And he murders him. He kills about 150 Nazis in the movie, personally, in hand-to-hand -hand combat, you know, or with explosives. But that was one of that was Ingrid Pitt's uh, first major role. She'd acted in numerous pictures, but that's the movie that put her on the map. Where well, she played the... Uh, yeah. She was... she a... played the... Heidi. She played Heidi. Right. Her character's name, Heidi. But with the other leading actress, uh, Mary Ewell, Robert Shaw's wife. Robert Shaw's wife. She was a very re highly respected stage actress. She died. Uh, uh, she, she died in seventy three yeah. or so. Both her and Robert Shaw died young. But uh, yeah, uh, she was she. Yeah, they both died young. She, she wasn't a suicide, was she? No, uh, she yeah, died of cancer, that, just like Ingrid Pitt. Yeah. But well, it's interesting that Ingrid Pitt was a natural blonde, a honey blonde. And, and Mary Ewer, when, when Ingrid was cast in the movie, this young up-and-coming you know, British-Polish actress, she said, no, no, uh, I can be the only blonde woman in this movie. And they made Ingrid, hair, they, they made Ingrid Pitt dye her hair dark. She couldn't be her natural Well, you blonde. always, in movies, you do that because you don't want, because, uh, you know, Ingrid Pitt was voluptuous about 
you know, when you think about them, then Mary Yor wasn't a great beauty, but she wasn't unattractive. You don't have two blondes in the same movie. That's, that's because true. audiences are, ve you know, you're, you're, you're vegging out. When you have two people that look alike, you don't know what the hell is going on. That, that is true. <laughs> oh, by the way, Clint Eastwood called the movie uh, "We're Stuntmen" there, and uh, Burton made a fortune off of that movie because he got ten percent. You know, <laughs> one point. It was sort of a big, a big comeback for Burton too. His he had it wasn't a comeback. Well, his first big hit years put him back on the map. Oh yeah, because uh, after. Uh, no, people don't remember what a huge hit uh, and how revolutionary the movie was. Uh, Who's afraid of Virginia Woolf? Because it's not. Yeah. It's a. It's so. It's still extraordinary. Mike Nichols directed it and Eldred Albee, but it wasn't. You know that they're saying "God damn" and stuff, which was made people go you know crazy back then. That's the movie that broke the uh, code, and uh, he, he, that he made a big he hit. Yeah. Put the stone in his shoe about the fact that he didn't get top billing and were eagles there. An argument over that. Well, I he doubt that. Him. I doubt that he could have got it over Burton because Burton was the huge star at the time. No, but, he, he couldn't. He couldn't. But he was pissed off because he. All right, Ed. Uh, don't use. Uh, why do you have to always be so vulgar? Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't realize the P word was wrong. You don't you realize hear? that uh, this is Manchester, New Hampshire. You know, we're back in 1946. I'm surprised that we we'll allow people to say "damn." <laughs> that's, that's right. They, they, still, they still bleep that Gone with the Wind up there, don't they, in the, the final scene? I first saw you were Gone with the Wind in 1976 in a uh, reissue at the Jerry Lewis Cinema, which is long gone now. Well, do you have any final words to say about your pal Sid Haig? Because we're wrapping oh, yeah, up. Oh, yes, one thing. Sid Haig told me, this is the kind of man he was. He told me, we, we talked about the money that you make at conventions, and a lot of these actors will claim they made a lot less. He said... I always claim exactly what I made because telling lies is too much work, like Mark Twain said. But he also said, I always give one-tenth of my salary to charity. And I thought, I said, what are you, uh, is this a religious thing? Is it the tithing? And he said, no, no, it's not. He goes, uh, I, I, I've been, I have been blessed because I struggled so long. And he said, uh, I feel like uh, I, I get more than I deserve. And he said, so I, whatever I, at the end of every month, I look at what I made. And I will choose randomly uh, uh, charities that catch my attention. I will willingly give one tenth of my salary to worthy charities, and not for tax write-offs or anything. It's just because it's the right thing to do. Okay, Ed. Uh, okay, yeah. Ed. Uh, you know you don't take direction very well on live TV, but uh, we have to go now. Thanks for being on. We'll have to rethink okay. having you on again because you are you're you're such an excitable boy. Yeah, I love the war like the war in Zevon. Okay, we'll talk to you later. Thanks for being on. I'm hanging up on you now before you f bomb or embarrass me again. Call. Bye. Call, call me back. <laughs> okay, folks, that certainly was a workout, and uh, I might have to. Uh, Brendan sent me this uh, via Dropbox. I, I want to look it over. Maybe we can take a couple of minutes out of it. Thanks. Uh, next week, uh, hopefully. Uh, uh, Veronette will be on with Rob as a veto. Thank you very much. Bye. Well, I'm certainly grateful for this magnificent washout, a turnout, and uh, now I'd like to say a few words. Hello? I must be going. I cannot stay. I came to say I must be going. I'm glad I came, but just the same, I must be going. La la. But I say no, you really. must stay. If you should go away, you spoil this party. I am through I'll stay a week or two, I'll stay the summer through, but I am telling you, I must be away. I'll do anything you say, in fact I'll even stay, but I must be There's something that I'd like to say that he's too modest to relate. The captain is a moral man. Sometimes he finds it trying. This fact I'll emphasize, Miss Stress. I never take a drink unless 